Welcome back. Now, the future of tax havens uh, is something that's becoming quite prominent in public debate. At the moment, it's coming under a lot of scrutiny. There's a lot of talk at the moment that the Swiss bank UBS may release the names of about 4,450 4, of its U.S. clients, and this could unleash a wave of uh, petitions for similar actions across the world. It's also going to probably set a precedent as to how uh, multi uh, lateral uh, laws are dealt with regarding this particular case, especially in Africa where lots of money has been lost to the continent to these tax havens. Joining us now just to discuss the question of tax havens is Philip Viviers, who's the MD of One Tax Business Trust. He joins myself and Jean-Francois Massier, our chief economist from Citibank, who's our guest host today. Philip, nice to see you. 2009 has been the year of the tax haven, I think. It is an issue that made it on the G20 agenda, will still be discussed at the upcoming G20 meeting in Washington in September, and it's something that African governments through institutions such as the African Development Bank are working vociferously to find a blueprint for. What is a tax haven? Thank Why you. are they important? Thank you, Lerata, and thank you for having me on the show. Yes, I think it's important to start off with what is a tax haven, and in essence, I'm going to explain it for the labor men out there what a tax haven is, and it's essentially a country that allows you to reduce your tax paid, or in other words, it is a country that's got a zero or a low tax jurisdiction. Does a tax haven necessarily attract tax evaders? Because that's the perception, is that people go to a tax haven because they're running away. Well, that's the perception. People think if they, when you talk about tax havens, that it's synonymous with the word tax evasion, and that's not always the case. There are many legitimate reasons of use, using tax havens, like for asset protection and estate planning. You should also remember that tax havens uh, are not the culprits always uh, in the scenario, mm -hmm. uh, as tax evaders uh, use schemes within the home jurisdiction yeah. as well. And the culprit is, and the G20 summit, if you clearly read those reports, does not have a problem with tax havens but the misuse of tax havens. Right. And that is a problem because it's easy to misuse a tax haven for tax right. evasion. I mean, obviously the recession has brought a lot of issues to head, but the US government argues that they lose about $100 billion in, uh, in revenue due to people putting their money away in tax havens. And that's essentially why they're going after uh, Americans with offshore accounts in Switzerland and the British Virgin Islands and Cayman Islands and the rest of it. But broadly speaking, why is this question gaining momentum? For the Americans, we understand the loss of revenue, but that the rest of the world has come in a quorum on this one? Well, you, I think the answer is in your question. It's, a, it's firstly, obviously, tax evasion, but if you look at it in a different level, it's an economic crisis. If you look at it, the countries now sit with a deficit on their budgets and don't have cash, and they need funds to spend on public uh, programs, infrastructure, and suddenly they don't have that cash available, so they need other sources of cash, and that's why they're looking into tax havens mm -hmm. to repatriate some funds. But on the other hand, you have to look at business owners and job losses, and every penny they could save obviously mm -hmm. means better cash flow for them as well. And that's why new, more businesses has also been looking at tax havens to save some uh, taxes as well to sustain jobs, etc. Now, the, the case that's quite prominent at the moment is with the Swiss bank UBS mm -hmm. and its negotiations with the American Internal Revenue Services, effectively the tax man in the United States. UBS, although is going to comply, they're quite concerned about the precedent this is going to set in terms of its sovereignty, protection of its clients, its ability to function independently as a bank, and this, these disclosure laws that exist in Switzerland, the right to privacy and not to be disclosing to foreign governments or any other entity the private details of its, its clientele. And that's a very sensitive one, because when I go to a bank, I'm not expecting the bank to just be releasing my records to all and sundry. Yes, if you look at the OECD, they, they, they've got these countries that need to sign tax information exchange agreements. And if you look at those names that will be released to America is through an, uh, a legitimate signed uh, foreign uh, tax exchange agreement. But if you also look at, it's only about 4,500 names that are going to be released to, to, to the USA out of a possible, when it was first investigated, 52,000. So it's less than 10%. So sometimes there are propagandas by these G20 countries stating that tax havens and all of these issues, but 90% of these 
tax havens are used for legitimate reasons. And that's mm -hmm. where, when they came down to a 4,500 uh, figure, which is less than 10% right. from the initial estimate. Th th those who've criticized the process right now regarding UBS and the American Internal Revenue Service say that even though you may get compliance right now, in the long term, it's going to be difficult because anybody who comes in and says, I want Philip Vivier's information, has to have a smoking gun. There has to be substantial evidence of your being a tax evader versus just scrutiny. Yes, but that's very important. Just think about it. A, a home country should have the responsibility to predict to protect their citizens. Now, you don't want somebody just coming to South Africa and asking immediately for your banking details, asking and any country in the world just getting your information. Mm -hmm. So obviously there must be uh, information exchange agreements between these countries to sign, and if they are signed, the, the signed agreement would set out exactly how these information would be shared. Okay, now the situation here, and I want to bring Jean-Francois into this, is that the Tax Justice Network conducts regular studies on the subject. And they found that 99, 99% of British publicly quoted companies often have subsidiaries that market themselves in tax havens. The figure for the United States is 83%. How are you gonna ensure accountability of corporates when it's such a prevalent issue for companies to have an offshore account? Well, accountability, that's a very difficult thing to account. All that a government can do is ask for those sort of information to be put into their tax returns and that it be uh, disclosed in a consolidated financial mm -hmm. statement. But coming to that, why 99% uh, countries got subsidiaries and tax havens in 83 in the US, is that it makes logical sense. If you really think about globalization and the world becoming one, is that uh, countries should compete with each other and tax is also a competition. If you've got two grocery stores, they obviously, obviously compete with each other and they keep their products prices down. But if the G20 summit obviously uh, defeats tax havens, they would form a cartel in tax and obviously when they form a cartel, they would, they would control tax and they would have no burden on themselves to uh, reduce a tax on businesses right. and that would slow down the economy as well. Okay, Jean-Francois, so we've got the blowdown on why tax havens are important and where the sensitivities lie. Now, when it comes to Africa, we've often been told that millions and billions of dollars has left Africa siphoned off by dictators who have Swiss bank accounts. That's, that's the general story of corruption and maladministration in Africa. It's an, an, a businessman in Africa would argue, I do a deal a legitimate deal, I've tendered for a contract, I make my money and then I don't have the necessary banking infrastructure to just invest my money. It's easier to go abroad. Well, that raises uh, several issues. I mean, one of them clearly is the, the quality of, as you say, of banking infrastructure and uh, regulation as well. I mean, a businessman wants to have a certain safety that uh, there's not going to be any maladministration of his funds, any misappropriation, uh, and uh, there, yes, he will probably be wanting to use another jurisdiction. Uh, obviously, the, the history of, of Africa since independence has been of uh, politicians or politically connected individuals siphoning uh, mm. uh, of funds um, to, uh, to tax havens. That is in part a story of governance in the African country, right. also a story of governance in the country from where the, the briber came from, when the country where, where, right. the, where the bank received the funds. And there, obviously, international cooperation is, is required, just like Philippe was saying on, on, on taxes, yes, it's good to have a little bit of tax competition, but obviously uh, the Principality of Monaco does not need the same resource base than uh, South Africa because it doesn't have development needs. So you should not just allow the small right. country to, have, uh, to attract uh, headquarters of companies which don't do any business there, right. but just, uh, just have zero tax. It has to be sort of like right. some rules globally probably about the location of uh, businesses, where do they make their business and therefore where should they pay their taxes? All right, gentlemen, we have to leave it there. Unfortunately, we've got a lot more to get through on Business AM. Philip Vivier is the Managing Director of One Tax Business Trust. Thank you so much for talking to us about this uh, very heated talking point in 2009. Time for us to check in on Asia.